you are here for a webinar on the benefits of hiring workers with autism. This webinar is presented by the Autism Society of North Carolina, and today's uh, presenter is Mindy Govan, who is our Transition and Employment Services Director. Hello everyone, my name is Mindy Govan, and I have been working in the field of autism for, I believe, well over 30 years. Um, and my particular area of interest is adolescents and young adults, um, or actually all adults. And so I wanted to take a minute today to present to you information about um, some of the basics around neurodiversity hiring, um, starting with what is neurodiversity. Um, we know that that's a buzzword these days. You hear it around a lot, the, the term neurodiversity or neurodiverse. And so I just wanted to make a, uh, take a minute to make sure that everyone was aware of what we're talking about. Um, you will also hear people using the term neurotypical, meaning um, the way the average population um, interprets and processes information. While neurodiverse, on the other hand, are those brains that um, process information a little bit differently. There may be differences in the social interactions, um, the way that folks are learning, um, mood regulation, attention, communication, and more. So all of those things fall under this big umbrella called neurodiversity. And you can see here in this graphic that um, there are lots of things that fall under this umbrella. Um, you can see dyspraxia, um, ADHD, um, mental health issues like anxiety and depression. Um, what you also notice is that these the circles are inter, um, interconnected. Um, and I use that to show that just because you have one particular area of neurodiversity, it doesn't exclude that you may have others. So you may come across individuals who have multiple um, processing, learning, brain differences um, that qualify them as being neurodiverse. So as I said, my expertise is the area of autism, and so I wanted to take just a minute to explain what autism is. We know that it's a neurodevelopmental condition. Now, we say neurodevelopmental means that the individual was born with it, so it, it happened early, um, likely in the womb, um, or early, early in the person's development. Um, and it varies from person to person. You may not see the exact same characteristics in each person, um, but it does vary. The other thing is it has lifelong effects and we notice them early in childhood. And then as people grow and develop, um, those characteristics change a little bit, but still fall under that umbrella. And the areas that are most likely to be different are um, the ability to have social relationships and social interactions. Communication is generally affected. Um, there may be restricted or repetitive um, patterns of thoughts or behaviors. Um, many years ago, people thought that Rain Man was the ideal person with autism, but I would probably guess that people who are on this webinar know someone who has autism or an autism spectrum disorder. Um, and if you know more than one, they probably aren't anything alike. Um, so along with autism, we as people come with our own personalities, our um, intelligence, our experiences, our family values. So each person with autism looks very different. I like to really um, embrace the idea of autism as a different culture. I feel like if we think about autism um, as a cultural difference, we can really look at um, our own personal experiences of maybe traveling to a different country where we don't speak the language, we aren't familiar with the customs, and the things that we do to kind of prepare for that kind of a trip. We try to learn about that other culture um, to prepare ourselves as much as we can. And so I think if we think about autism as a different culture, we're also gonna prepare ourselves for how to best interact and understand um, what's going on in that culture. And also 
that way we're thinking about autism as a difference instead of maybe a deficit or a disability. We want to think about it as an interaction and communication difference. Um, I think it helps us to be very understanding and patient um, with the people that we're interacting with much as we would with um, someone from a different culture. Um, and we want to be culturally sensitive. I like to use the example that, um, you know, in the Asian countries, their custom of saying hello is by bowing um, out of respect. Our culture in America is that we stick out our hand for a good old handshake. Um, and so a good um, representation of being culturally sensitive is when I worked um, with a company that did a lot of interaction with um, the Japanese culture. Um, you can imagine we both studied up on each other. And so when we went to meet, um, we Americans respectively bowed um, to show our um, sensitivity and our friends from Japan stuck out their hand. So it was still a really um, kind of awkward moment, but we were being culturally sensitive to each other. I think the other thing to think about also with the difference um, in Asian um, culture is the idea that respect is that you do not make direct eye contact with those who are in authority. Um, and for our culture in um, America, we expect people to make good eye contact as a way of showing respect. So just, I throw those things out there to help us remember that we're dealing not necessarily with a, a deficit per se, but just a cultural difference. And we want to respect that difference. So as I mentioned, there are some neurological differences in people with autism spectrum disorder. Um, ASD is short for autism spectrum disorder. And um, years ago, people, uh, I'm sorry, the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Manual, changed the term um, from autistic, I think there was Asperger's disorder, um, and pervasive developmental disorders, and they really took into effect that really all of these things um, fall under a spectrum of autism. And so we're going to use that term autism spectrum disorder or ASD. So when we think about the differences, one of the largest areas we think about is their ability to communicate or that communication difference. Um, we know that words are, um, that communication is much more than words. Um, we communicate with our hands, our eyes, our faces. Um, we do a lot of things to communicate or to express what it is we're thinking or feeling. Um, one of the things that we know is that our brains kind of naturally um, adjust for the communication level of the person that we're speaking with. So if you have a two-year-old or a three-year-old, you're naturally going to um, make your communication more simplified. You're going to use more simple words. And then if you're talking with a coworker um, who is extremely intellectual, you are also going to um, try to speak back to them at the same level. Um, this is important because in the area of autism, we know that processing or that, that ability to take the language and process it around, figure out what you're saying or asking, and then give you an answer back is pretty complicated for them and it, it doesn't work as quickly. So we are going to be looking at what are the other ways that we can help enhance our language. Um, Another thing that we use to help understand when people are communicating is that context for clarity. Um, we often try to put what we're saying in the context of what the conversation is about or what we're experiencing in the moment. Um, neurotypical people have a variation in their tone of voice um, when they are saying things like, pay attention versus pay attention. Um, our tone of voice can really 
emphasize um, how we're feeling or maybe the seriousness or the con puts a little context around what we're saying. Um, and neurotypical people are very um, adept at using their body language or gestures to um, communicate, communicate clearly. Um, I often laugh and think about um, how many of you all experience the mom look. You know, you're misbehaving and the mom gives you the look. You know you're going to get in trouble. Um, she doesn't have to say anything. She could just give you a look and you know you better stop what you're doing. So that's the importance of our body language and our gestures. Um, for neurotypical people, pick that up, understand exactly what it means, and then make an adjustment. Emailing and texting are words in black and white. Um, it's very difficult to convey uh, emotions, intonations, things like that. Um, and so I think if we think about the term or, or the, the context of using texting or emailing, I think this is why we developed emojis. Um, because it doesn't, the words themselves don't actually um, give that extra emphasis that we neurotypical people think need to be added. Um, however, people with autism look at an email or a text as what it is. It's black and white language and they're going to take it for the concrete context that it's giving them. How does this, you know, how does communication differences in the way that we're processing, how can that lead to challenges? Well, one of the things that we know about people with autism um, or people on the spectrum, um, one of the things that they have difficulty with is something that neurotypical people think is very easy, asking for help. However, it's actually pretty complicated when you come to think of it. Um, in order to ask for help, first you have to recognize what you're doing isn't working. So you have to realize that you have a problem. Then you have to understand that there are people in the world who have different experiences and skills and talents that you may not have. So you, may ha you have to recognize that there's somebody else who can do what you're having difficulty doing. Then you have to formulate the language on how do you ask that, how do you express what it is that you need or what's not working and ask that person for help. Who do you ask and how do you ask and what do you ask are very complicated when you think about it. So um, I don't know if the, you know someone with autism, you may have seen them sitting there and realize, just, just ask me to open that for you. Or um, we find ourselves saying, do you need help? Um, sometimes it's hard to recognize um, when you should communicate something because for instance, if I am going to the copier and it's out of paper, I might assume that you all know it's out of paper and not realize that I should probably go communicate that we need more paper. Um, and so those types of things don't come natural to someone who's on the spectrum. Um, sometimes our folks with autism over communicate or under communicate. So an example of over communicating is that they're saying something to you over and over again. So maybe um, I realize I need to ask you for paper and I go up and say, the copier's out of paper. You know, you, we need to order the paper. Have you ordered the paper yet? We've got to get the paper. And, um, and it's making sure that you're processing, you neurotypical person, are you processing that we need paper? Under communication is just that, um, just really not saying much. And they, they're thinking it, but they're not processing it out. Um, and it's really hard sometimes to understand um, or judge the importance of the communication from your supervisor or your coworker. Um, neurotypical people often say, you know, you might want to finish that up and turn it in. Is that really what you mean? Um, because you could also say, um, you might want to be here by 830. Well, that doesn't mean if you're the supervisor, the person on the spectrum may not interpret that as what you're really saying is be here by 830. 
you're saying you might want to. Well, what if I don't want to be here at 8.30? So those kinds of things are judges. Um, and we want to think about the fact that that person on the spectrum wants to know the specifics and wants you to be very clear um, in your communication with them. I want to show you this little clip. Um, what she's talking about is... Um, doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about, but she's talking about dating. Um, but what I really want you to focus on is what she is saying about the difficulties in communication that she's experiencing as a person on the spectrum. So let's talk about some ways that people can meet me in the middle. Because I know that I'm not the only woman who struggles with this. But the problem is other women don't want to talk about it because it's embarrassing to suck so badly at something that everybody else around you thinks is completely natural. You know? So one, I mean, the first thing I have to say is if you want to date someone with autism, please go and read up about it first. It, it saves so much hassle. You will react with understanding and sympathy instead of with rejection and ridicule. Secondly, I wish I could meet someone who would have a no talking date with me. So that means we sit and communicate using handheld devices, but we're sitting right next to each other. So we still have the real life connection. And if you're wondering why, if you're wondering why, this is because for someone with autism, dealing with conversation is one of the most overwhelming things in the world. Because when I'm having a conversation, I'm watching your body language, which I don't really understand anyway. I mean, facial expressions, it's all confusing, right? I'm trying to listen to what you're saying, but then I'm also trying to block out all the sounds and the noise and going, ah, what's going on. I'm trying to read your lips because I'm also trying to make sure that I don't miss what you're saying. If I miss anything that I can't hear, I've got to pick it up from your lips. And then I've also got to worry about myself. I have to make sure that my own face is in the right configuration to say, oh, I'm having fun. Right? <laughs> you have to, I, have to, I have to edit what I'm saying so that I make sure that I don't offend you, some, you know, accidentally. I have to monitor my own body language and... And, and deal with my own discomfort because even things, even sensory stimulation like having smart clothes on is unbearable for me. It's, it's horrible. So I would actually truly be rather be in my room, uh, you know, barefoot in front of my computer. But I make the effort to go out and interact with people in person. So it would be nice if people could meet me halfway. I think the next thing to say is please verbalize right it's i know you guys all understand what a what a wink or a head tilt means but we barely even notice if we even understand what, what you're doing right um ideally you should say things like i'm having a really good time with you and i'd like to put my arm around you now so that we can logically process the information and prepare for the stimulation that's going to come instead of going touching gross, gross. <laughs> So I think she does a really good job of explaining her own um, abilities and difficulties with that communication. Um, and I want to reiterate that um, people who are on the spectrum really prefer concrete, direct conversation and communication. So one of the things that I want to point out here is just how much our tone or inflection can influence what we're saying. Now, this is more for the neurotypical people who can pick up on a change in tone. I want you to see that here are eight sentences say exactly the same thing. But where you put your emphasis in the sentence changes the meaning, okay? Um, so I didn't tell her you were stupid. I might have implied it. I might have rolled my eyes or... Um, I may have emailed it to her. I didn't tell her you were stupid. I told everybody else. Um, I didn't tell her you were stupid. 
might have said you were crazy or something like that. So see, if you look at that, where you put that emphasis, it totally changes the meaning of the sentence. But if you're on the spectrum, it is exactly what it says, and there is no other way to interpret it. And so those are things that we need to understand in that cultural sensitivity, that when we are expressing communication with things other than words, written or verbal, um, that the person we're communicating with might miss those things. And they could be pretty important things. So this is how we might support um, a coworker or a student or another young adult um, who is on the spectrum about when do you need to communicate? So we would give the person with autism these kind of prompts. So when do you need to speak up or ask for help? When you don't know what to do. For example, you're finished with an assignment and you don't know what you're supposed to do next. Um, now, for the neurotypical person, they may just automatically know that when you finish it, you need to go ask someone for what they do next, okay? Um, so when you don't have enough of something, when you're stuck, so these are just little ideas. When I worked with college students, I would give them um, a to-do list that said, when do I need to contact my professor? Well, probably at the end of each week, um, after each test, so certain things like that that um, that don't come natural to folks on the spectrum. Um, they just need to know when the best time or when are the things that are important. When is it that I need to communicate with someone and who do I need to communicate with? So the who is another thing that's um, a little unclear sometime. Um, when you went to work wherever you work, I bet you were kind of told who, um, who is the janitor or who do you call if something is broken? Um, who do you call if your computer's not working? Um, and you may have made a note about it or I don't know how you absorb that information. But for the person who's on the spectrum, once the words are finished being spoken, they disappear. So having it written down is a good way for them to remember. So this is just a simple little strategy where we can say, who do you ask? So what's the problem? I'm going to say, um, my computer's not working. And so who can help me? Um, that would be my IT person. And then the contact information. And so I have that. I can pin it up on my board um, or keep it in my drawer. But it's information that's not going to disappear. And it tells me exactly who and how to get up with that person. Um, the when and where you um, communicate with that person, if it's an issue, you might want to say um, contact IT at lunch or between 10 and 11 or something like that. But when is the best time and how's the best way? If your computer's not working, you can't send them an email. Um, and so you might want to uh, send them a text or go by their office. Just those pieces of information that neurotypical people are picking up um, that people on the spectrum just need to be um, more visual and concrete. I like to um, reinforce what we call the notepad strategy. And basically, the notepad strategy is write it down. Um, do you have to literally have a notepad? No. Um, nowadays, you can shoot someone a text. If I'm sitting in the cafeteria and I think, oh, you need to go by and ask somebody something, I can write it on a napkin and hand it to you. The reason I say the notepad strategy is to really re-emphasize that individuals on the spectrum have very good processing through their visual intake. So things that are written, things they can see, um, much more effective and better at processing the information. Again, as I mentioned, when you stop talking, those words disappear. And I think we probably have all experienced this, but you're walking down the hallway and somebody says, hey, can you send me information on such and such a project? And you're like, sure. But then you get distracted before you get to your desk. 
and you're like, now what was that I was supposed to send? What was that? If it's written down for you, piece of cake. Easy to remember and follow up on. So we like to say, write it down. The other reason I say that the notepad strategy works is because if you write it down, something I haven't mentioned is that use of sarcasm or all the extra words and um, descriptions and things that aren't really necessary, but for some reason us neurotypical people think we have to add into things. Um, when you have to write something down, you're short, you're clear, you're very direct in what it is. The other thing I want to emphasize is if you could not draw a picture of what it is that you're trying to communicate, then it's too abstract. For instance, I need you to speed up. I need you um, to work faster. Um, how can you draw a picture of faster um, or hurry? Anything that you can't quickly draw a picture of, it's too abstract. So we want to make sure that we're very clear and direct, and then that's going to increase um, the success of our communication with that person and the accuracy of what that person needs to do. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about those differences in the social interactions for individuals who are on the spectrum. Um, what we know is that every workplace has its own set of rules. Um, maybe you worked in one place where you had dress down Fridays or Team Spirit Tuesdays, or things like that where you wore something different. Um, not only that, you might have, um, maybe you have birthday celebrations once a month in the, in the cafeteria for anybody who has a birthday in that month, and everybody is expected to come. Um, those are things that probably aren't written in your policy and procedures um, book, or your employee handbook. The other thing is um, some more things that we talk about that are, are kind of social things. I bet when you go into work, you usually have a little bit of social chit chat with someone. Um, how, what did you do this weekend? How are the kids? Things like that. Um, how long are you allowed to have that social chit chat? Um, is five minutes enough? Is 20 minutes too long? Um, how do you determine when it's not a good time to have social chit chat? Or maybe there's a group of you who are having social chit chat and then somebody says, oh, the boss is walking in. Guess what happens? Everybody disperses and goes straight to work. Um, those kinds of social rules are what we call hidden curriculum. It's something that everybody else seems to know, but the person on the spectrum doesn't. They don't necessarily pick it up. Um, we, we see this often in schools where the neurotypical kids are joking and, and picking on each other and, or maybe they're bullying somebody and they do it when the teacher's not looking. <clears throat> the person with autism is doing the same thing but doesn't for some reason realize that when the teacher turns around you should stop. Um, and so they're getting in trouble. So we want to think about what are all these little rules that you follow at work or in the community and how did you learn those? Um, those are the things that we call that hidden curriculum. So um, things that we might think about within the work environment is um, that our folks who are on the spectrum may not be quite as outgoing um, as other people. I'm sure they would love, maybe they would like to sit with others um, on lunch break, but maybe not. And so we're not really sure. They may not be as fluent as others and they, they might have some struggles with some of those um, social demands. Um, I actually worked with a young lady who was a geophysicist with um, a pretty important gas company. She had a PhD and she was fired for not being a team member because she would not participate in the birthday celebrations or kind of the off work celebrations if there was a baby shower or something like that. And so they just felt like she wasn't a team player. 
But if we are culturally sensitive and realize that those things, um, those type of unexpected events or not work-related events um, are very confusing for a person on the spectrum. They're very interested. They want to work because they like the work that they're doing. And to go to the cafeteria to sing happy birthday, which is a little sensory overwhelming anyway, um, doesn't it just doesn't fit in their brain why that should happen or um, because it's not what I need to do. Um, so some of those social things can be confusing and um, misconstrued for, the, for that cultural difference about why um, you don't want to come celebrate or, hey, um, the boss is letting us leave two hours early today. Um, we have a young man um, who I work with who realizes he knows that he has 30 minutes for lunch but then um the whole group was going to go out um so his whole team was going to go out and have a a group lunch and they invited him along and and he went but then after it was getting close to 30 minutes he was getting very stressed and upset because the lunch hour was going to be over not the lunch hour the 30 minutes was going to be over and the other folks didn't seem um upset about it and so again what we're trying to for that person to understand that as the team is going out the the rules are a little looser so those are hard for folks to understand um, we could see that some social interactions could become a little awkward um, for the neurotypical person and so if we think about somebody at work and um, you want to have uh, just a friendship or a relationship with someone um, not a sexual relationship but just a friendship um, and they say hello to you and um, if I'm on the spectrum I think that's really nice I like this person so I'm gonna you know text them and um, because that's what people do is they text people right and so and then on the weekend if I don't have a lot of social stuff going on, I might keep texting this person, this one person. Um, and so then for the neurotypical person, they may feel like they're being stalked. They may feel very awkward about this interaction, like you're just a coworker, you're not like my best friend. Um, so it can create some, a little bit of awkwardness. A simple solution is to say, hey, um, I'm your coworker. Um, I'm happy for you to text me once or twice um, during the work week, but on the weekends I'm doing stuff with my family, so I would prefer not to. Um, <clears throat> we neurotypical people worry about, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, um, about how that feels to the person with autism. I can tell you the person with autism is much more appreciative to understand because they don't want things to feel awkward and they just don't have the understanding. Sometimes now if we think about this as that same situation and it's a male-female, so maybe it's the male who's on the spectrum and a female who he's texting, you can imagine that that um, could very easily end up in um, HR if we think about it as sexual harassment or things like that. Um, and it could be clearly just a misunderstanding. So I want to talk about this for just a minute. Let's look at um, some of the behaviors that you might see and how um, a non-culturally sensitive um, person might interpret that behavior. So maybe someone is talking a lot about certain topics they like. And then the other person, the neurotypical coworker, might think, wow, he's a jerk. He really just thinks about himself, talks about himself. Um, might seem distracted in group meetings. You know, you could see where that could come across as he's not interested in the meetings. He, he doesn't really want to participate. He's not paying attention. Um, he might say things that could be judged as rude. And then you think about, wow. Um, really not so uh, sensitive to how somebody else might feel. So I just want to, I'm not going to read all of them because I know that you all can read, um, but just keeping those things in mind that this might be how we're interpreting. But instead, what I wanted to do is say, all right, now 
we've taken our cultural sensitivity and we're going to have these same situations and how do we respond now um this person talks a lot about certain topics that they like well now we know well maybe they just don't know how to interact or to initiate a conversation with you so they always they can talk about the things that they enjoy and that they feel comfortable talking about maybe that's why they're only talking about the same topic um, they seem to be distracted in group meetings and maybe now we know that they have difficulty processing all this verbal information um, at one time but also figuring out mm, what does this have to do with my project um, and so just giving more understanding. Saying things that could be judged as rude. Um, <clears throat> for instance, maybe I come into work and I just got my hair cut and I, I say, hey, look, I just got my hair cut. What do you think? Well, a person with autism may say, I don't like it. Are they being rude? Are they trying to hurt your feelings? Not at all. Um, you asked a question, do you, do you, how, what do you think, how do you like it? And they're speaking the truth. Because for a person with autism, it's very important to speak the truth. And um, because they like to do the right thing. People who are on the spectrum generally want to be rule followers. They want to do things the right way. And they're missing that um, social understanding that it actually might hurt your feelings. Um, and so we can just do some education, right? Um, again, we want to think about that. They may not immediately respond to an instruction or a direction. <clears throat> I think what we have to keep in mind is that um, I mentioned that their verbal processing is slower. It takes a while to get where it needs to be and, and to really fully understand what's being said. And we live in a do-it-now com um, community, I can't think of the word, but we are very, you know, if I text you and you don't immediately text me back, oh, something must be wrong. But we're thinking about, you know, we want immediate gratification. And really, if you waited for just a few minutes, so if you said, hey, what, um, what was that final number you came up with? Um, it may take them a few seconds. But what I'd like you to do is try to just time out maybe 15 seconds and realize it's just 15 seconds, but we are, we're probably asking it again. So we say, hey, do you have those numbers? What was the final number? That was only five seconds. And for us, it feels like, ooh, that's awkward, that, that dead space. Um, but really, the person is processing and being sure that they can give you out the information that you're asking for. So those are things to think about. So why is some of this social stuff hard? Well, we know that the origin of the word autism comes from self. Um, and early on, people felt that young children with autism were self-absorbed you know they lived in their own world and those types of things what we do know is that even very bright people who are on the spectrum struggle to understand other people's perspective again <clears throat> you have to realize that there's people in the world that have different experiences than you do preferences and things like that so it's really hard to to take somebody else's perspective and realize that it's different than your own. Um, and, and that is truly difficult for people with autism. Um, and in the same respect, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, if I said, well, how would you feel if I said, I don't like your haircut? That's very difficult for them to process and understand because they really have a, just that inability to, to figure out that you are responding and feeling differently than they are. Sometimes it's hard as well to pick up on all the different contextual cues. So remember I said you might be chit-chatting with your coworkers and then the boss walks in um, and the person on the spectrum may not pick up on that. He may just see that all of you stop talking and walk away and, and not have a real good understanding of what happened. Because those social rules can change 
um, very quickly and can be very subtle. Um, you know, if you're laughing and joking and then the boss walks in, everyone's going to stop. And that's a very quick change, and it, and you did it for a subtle reason. Um, so we have to think about some of those things. It's not, you know, again, it's a difference. It's a cultural difference. And so we just need to be more sensitive to that and more patient. Um, this is a young man on the spectrum who's going to tell you a little bit about what he's learned now that he's an adult. I'm trying to think back of where I was at in middle school and what I wish I had known. Um, eye contact is way more important than you give it credit for. Um, eye contact is the way by which people signal interest in one another. So even though people's faces are generally pretty boring and you don't want to look them in the eye because there are uh, more interesting things in rooms to look at, um, you should look them in the eye anyway, because it is basically a way of saying you are worth paying attention to. Likewise, if somebody is not making eye contact with you as you are trying to talk with them, it's a pretty strong indication that they do not want you to interact with them socially, and you should find some polite way to try and exit the conversation, you know, thank them for their time and leave. Make sure that there is turn-taking in conversation. When I was younger, I felt as though if I managed to retain control, like narrative control over the conversation, that it was less likely to go awry because the chances that somebody else would say something that would cause it to deviate off script would be lower. But if you don't give people a chance to respond in a conversation, then they become bored and no longer wish to interact with you. So make sure to give them time, and in all honesty, you will have a better conversation, even if it goes slightly off script, if you give them the opportunity to say things than if you just try to be the person who talks the entirety of the time. Just don't give up. Um, you might feel like there are a lot of doors closed to you, but there are also a lot of doors open. Like, I, I haven't spoken too much about it because I don't like talking about it because I feel like it's bragging, but there are strengths that come along with Asperger's syndrome. You know, you have a mind that works more logically and in some ways less emotionally. And so that gives you a lot of power in certain fields and disciplines, computing, mathematics. Um, because of that, there are people who will be incentivized to want you in their company or in their lives or something like that. And because of that, as long as you're able to act socially, socially passable, then, I mean, people are willing to forgive a few faux pas, especially if they understand what's going on. I really like his explanation um, there, and it's it's good to hear from a person on the spectrum about their own experiences and, and what he wish he had known. Um, this slide talks about the, you know, the social faux pas. Um, we want to try to concentrate on the things that people are doing well and not really focusing on the things that they, that they may make a mistake. Um, and maybe maybe your coworker doesn't come sing happy birthday but they are um, spot on and doing all of the projects and getting the the data analyzed um, without error and on time and faster than anybody else you've had so you just want to think about yeah maybe they don't do everything but i think that's the same for all of us honestly um, i certainly have made a few faux pas at work um, and I'm glad that people focus on my strengths. Um, so let's think about how we can support those coworkers or um, employees. We want to think about how we can understand things from their perspective. So thinking back on that, um, the chart of, you know, maybe they're not paying attention um, or seem distracted in the staff meeting. So what kind of strategies can we give them? First, we want to define what the issue is. You know, you seem like you're not um, paying attention, um, that you don't want to be there. Um, you're going to try to understand it from their perspective, like some of the things I mentioned that may be way too much verbal information. Um, he, they might have a difficult time seeing um, the relevance and what it has to do with their part of the project. Um, and so then when we talk about using different skills and strategies to support them, we're going to think about, okay, well, why is it important? 
So what I did, um, I um, have presented, I have a client who is working in data analytics um, at a large company and he didn't get why he needed to listen to the other parts. And so what we did was had his supervisor create kind of a little flow chart that showed the process and where his piece of what he was doing fit in to the process of the project along the way. That was much more helpful for him because it wasn't looking at his project in isolation. He could see that it was part of a longer process and that who was responsible for the different parts of the project helped him to have a much greater understanding of the purpose of the meeting. The other thing was that we said, hey, you know, why don't you just write down for him who he is supposed to speak after in the meeting because he may not just pick that up. So look, you're gonna speak after Mark and you're gonna give this week's totals on um, whatever. So then what we're doing is really providing him all the information he needs to be successful in that situation or in that staff meeting. And he's an active participant, it makes sense to him. And it really was just defining what it was, what was the purpose of it, why, and what he needed to do. So it's, it's not a lot of support, but it is just explaining things to make sense. So here, one of the issues, believe it or not, we run into this quite frequently is um, not responding to greetings um, with your coworkers. Um, and us neurotypical people having a problem with that and thinking, you know, are you in a bad mood? Um, do you not like being here? Are you, um, you know, do you hate it here? But really, that's not it at all. So that we want to define what the problem is. You know, you're not responding to greetings from your coworkers. Think about it. How many of you, when you go into work, say hello to the people that you work with? Do you say hello to every single person in the office? Or do you have a specific few that you say hi to? Do you only respond to the people who say hi to you? I mean, that, if you think about it, it's like, that's pretty complicated. Um, it shouldn't be, but it's one of those hidden curriculum things like how many people do you say hello to and how do you respond okay but if we think about it from the perspective of the person with autism the cultural sensitivity piece so we're thinking about actually that person with autism is very focused on their work and that social nicety uh, is really a waste of time you're not paying me to say hello to everybody you're paying me to get to my desk and get busy with what I'm supposed to do. So it's, again, culturally what's important to each is different. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna make some really simple rules. We're gonna give them the strategies and we're gonna say, hey, you need to say hi, hello, good morning to at least three people. That's good. <clears throat> but you should also say hi or hello if somebody says it to you. So we're just gonna say this is, you just have to do it, okay? Um, and then we're gonna give them a little self-monitoring tool so that they know how they're doing. Um, because when the day has passed, it's sometimes hard to remember, did I do that yesterday? Um, or how am I doing? And then we wanna, why is it important in the first place? So we wanna say to that, you know, I like that you are a dedicated employee but I need people to work together. And when you don't say hello, your coworkers think that you don't like them, you're not happy, and they might av avoid working with you. And we just want everybody to work as a team. So now we've explained what he needs to do, how often, and why um, those are important. So we just want to remember that we need to be sensitive to the fact that social expectations change all the time. You might get a new supervisor who implements new rules. Um, you might just have a fun, a culture committee who decides that, you know, we're going to have a taco bar every Tuesday and everybody brings stuff. Just things that are different. <clears throat> and all we need to do is to remember just to be providing those clear expectations. We want to be really supportive and say, you know what? We're, the other coworkers think this is really fun. If you could just bring a bag of shredded cheese on Tuesday, if you don't want to eat the tacos, that's okay. But 
we want you to participate. And your participation is bringing the bag of cheese. So we're trying to understand it from their perspective. So we want to always think about, okay, this is what we're experiencing and thinking, but what is the person with autism experiencing and thinking? Um, and I'll talk to you later that, you know, you keep us folks at the Autism Society on speed dial, and we can be that cultural interpreter if needed, okay? Um, so now let's talk about some of the other things that may impact. Um, and I don't use the word impact in a negative way because some of those things are very positive as well. Um, organization is an executive function um, and that can be very confusing for some people with autism. Um, what we know about the learning style of individuals with autism is they're very detail oriented. So every detail has the same level of importance um, across the project. Neurotypical people look at all the details and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, place value on different things or they have the ability to sequence and know how long something's going to take and um, how to prioritize it within the day. A very important um, cultural difference in autism is what I'm going to call the concept of time. We know that individuals um, on the spectrum can tell time like nobody's business. They can read an analog clock, a digital clock. They know that a minute is 60 seconds, all of those things. Those are, um, that is concrete time. The concept of time is more that feeling of time. So think about if I were to say to you, I'm gonna talk for five more minutes. I'm not, by the way, but if I wanna talk for five more minutes, you automatically can kind of gauge what that feels like. How do you do that? How do you know what five minutes feels like? If your significant other says, hey, we need to leave here in about five minutes, you're probably not gonna go jump in a shower. Okay, so there are things that you realize um, about time that people in the culture of autism don't have. They don't have that button, that ability. Um, and so if you can imagine when you're looking at all those details of work that need to be done, <clears throat> if they can't feel how long it's going to take to do a certain piece, then they are are organizing themselves in a way to get everything done um, in a different way. So moving from activity to activity or interrupting someone um, to, you know, hey, can you stop what you're doing? I need you to process this first. Um, that, that can be a little bit hard because I have figured out as a person with autism, what needs to be done and in what order to make sure that everything I need to be done is done by the end of the day. So we need to, to think about those things. Um, and also if you're working on a project until it's done, um, that can be something that's difficult in that um, we've had individuals get in trouble for accruing overtime because they don't realize what part of the project they can put on pause and pick up again when they come back the next day. What's more important, completing the activity or staying within the eight hour, nine hour day? Um, cultural differences. Um, and so we need to think about again that lacking that concept of time um, <clears throat> means that your coworkers are likely to be a little bit more rigid in what they do because if they've figured out a way to make sure that everything gets done. If you move one piece or change one piece, it's gonna throw everything off. Um, so here is a simple way that you know you could, again, it's, a, it's that written down schedule of when you need to do things. Um, I know that I have an agenda. Um, I use on my phone what's happening every day. I can't, you know, I have to look at it. I don't know what's happening the next three days. Um, but then if I have to 
squeeze something in, so we have an emergency meeting that has to take place, then I can put it on the calendar and see where to go. So again, this is showing you that having things visual organizes and structures that time for our folks on the spectrum. I want to quickly go back and say, remember I said every person with autism is different? <clears throat> I want you to remember that because not every person with autism is going to need this, this kind of structure. They may have other types of structure that works better for them. Um, so we, I just mentioned to you that if if my way of organizing the specific details in my day, um, you can see where a change or a fluctuation um, in that workload could kind of throw me off. Um, and so what we want to, uh, again, understand is that concept of where is that emotional stress coming from when something has changed. And then it's helpful for the neurotypical person to just say, oh, well, that's okay. This is where um, you're going to do less of this and you're going to do a little bit more of this. Um, but again, if you make it visual, it's much easier for that person on the spectrum to comprehend. Um, we are going to have to, everyone has to be flexible when things are new. So you're introducing a new task, you're introducing a new staff. Um, <clears throat> those things for a person on the spectrum we call unpredictable. Um, and individuals with autism like predictability. They like to know what to do, when to do it, how to do it. They, they love things to be very understood and that way they're extremely um, effective in getting everything done. When there are changes, it's very helpful to let them know ahead of time um, and just be clear in understanding that that's an area that might be hard for them. Neurotypical people love spontaneous things, um, not all of them, um, but they like changes. They like things to um, change and be different and spontaneous. Um, <clears throat> and people on the spectrum don't. They, they're they very good at jobs that other people may not like, that require that you do the same thing every day, the same way. And they um, might feel very comforted by that type of task. Um, so that's where they can, you know, bring benefit to your company. So again, when we think about all of us in our jobs have short-term goals and long-term goals, it's important to be very clear for the person on the spectrum on what is it that you're monitoring um, and how are you monitoring it. Because it's also a good self-check for people. Um, this is a self-monitoring form um, that one of our clients needed to use. Um, they were getting to work on time, then they'd forget their badge in the car, which meant then they had to go back out to their car, and then by the time they checked in, they were late. And then we add those greetings. So this way, they can get to their desk and go, yep, I was here on time, I brought my badge in, and I said hello to three people. It's gonna be a great day. So again, just ways to monitor. Dealing with stress and stressors at work are another area of difference for um, individuals on the spectrum. Many of us have a way to regulate. We have a way of going, you know what, I'm, I'm a little edgy today. Okay, now I'm really irritated. Now I'm really annoyed. And now I'm just plain frustrated. <clears throat> For a person on the spectrum, they don't necessarily have that gradation in, in emotion and skill. They're fine. And then it, sometimes it seems like now they're not fine and there was nothing in between. Um, and part of that is just um, not having those levels of self-awareness um, that my emotions are changing, not having words for all those emotions. So you may see um, an exaggerated response to something. Um, maybe they're going into the cafeteria they go every day and today by gosh somebody burnt popcorn 
Well, a lot of us have a sensory response, but the person with autism may have a much more exaggerated response. They may actually start gagging or things like that because their sensory system as a whole is much more alert. Um, sometimes you might see a confusing response to stress. Everyone else is crying because something bad has happened and yet the coworker is over there just working away like nothing. Um, again, it's, it's that not understanding that social situation that's going on or the importance. We also may have someone who's just dysregulated and so you all are crying and they're laughing or you might be laughing and they're crying. Um, it's just a difference. Their, their regulation of their emotions and stress are very different. Um, but we all, neurotypical and neurodiverse, we all have to have ways to deal with stress throughout the day. Um, I like to get up and go for a walk. If I'm sitting there writing a report <clears throat> and I'm stuck, um, I need to just take a few minutes and go for a walk. If there's a vending machine, I might go buy a pack of nabs. Who knows? Um, sometimes when I know I have a really stressful day, I like to write down on a sticky note everything that has to get done and I find pure enjoyment in marking them off as I'm getting through things. Um, again, we all have ways that we deal with stress and that's the same for our folks with um, autism. Sometimes they need a visual reminder. Um, so these are just some little little um, cues or things that some of our folks use. Um, the little bookmark system um, that's on my right is it looks like a flower and a candle actually what this is is a deep breathing reminder um, so we're going to smell the flower and then we're going to blow out the candles so it's a way to, to give someone a visual about how to do some deep breathing on the other side we have another kind of just a quick de-stress little reminder elevator breaths is how this person with autism understands taking a deep breath so we're going to take an elevator breath it's going to go up and then down okay three shoulder strokes count to 20 give myself a positive affirmation I can do this keep calm and carry on so it's just a little de-stressor reminder um, and when you make them small, they can be portable. So for this person, they can put it in their wallet and they have a quick reminder. And you as a coworker might see them getting stressed and say, hey, why don't you pull out your, um, your de-stress, you know? Or your coworker has the flowers hanging up on their cubby, you could just walk by and point to it. That might just be like, okay, I need to just take a second. Um, when we practice it, again, um, it becomes more natural and it's a calming routine. So we are going to support our individuals with awesome to say, you know what? Hey, why don't you just take a break? Go get a drink of water and come back. Different ways that we can practice or show them, um, you know what? Sometimes we have fire drills. Here's a place that you can go when there's a fire drill. So showing them. Um, if you get overwhelmed with something, here's where the water fountain is. You can go get a drink of water. Um, there's usually a quiet space in this office nobody ever uses. Just giving them um, the resources ahead of time so that when something happens, we all have a way to de-stress, okay? So now let's think about how do we give our... Um, staff corrective feedback. The neurotypical people, we have a very hard time with this. You know, we say, mm, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I'm not really sure what to say. Um, but in reality, that person on the spectrum is going to respect you and appreciate you for giving direct feedback. How many times do we hear um, someone who gives an apology and the person say that's okay it's not that big of a deal well no it is a big deal 
Um, so we just have these, I call them fluff and stuff kind of ways that we're avoiding being direct. Well, in the autism culture, they prefer directness. So we need to be really careful about how to do that. And this is um, a way that we're telling our person with autism, hey, be aware that you're getting feedback. It's okay for people to give you feedback. They're not necessarily telling you what to do. They're just giving you feedback. Be positive about it. Be positive to the person. Say, okay, I can do that. Thank you. Um, be positive and tell yourself everybody gets feedback. It's not just me. Everybody gets that. If you're feeling stressed, do your stress relaxation and be positive. I can do that. And then revise or implement what you've been asked to do. And if you're not sure, ask somebody for help. And then you can give yourself a reward. Hey, congratulations, you did it. You might go get a Snickers bar. You might go for, you know, whatever it is. Um, but we're doing that. Neurotypical people are kind of doing that to themselves. You know, you're remembering it for yourself. You're being positive. Um, and for the person with autism, we're just making it visual. So it's an easy reminder. So why hire someone who's neurodiverse? Um, I'm going to let her talk to you a little bit about some of those. Neurological differences like autism or ADHD are considered to be dysfunctional disorders and disabilities under the medical model of mental health. There's too little attention given to enabling people with neurologically different minds to be accepted for themselves, to discover and celebrate their strengths, and to find a place in society that values their differences. When most of us think of diversity, we think of things like race or sexual orientation. But there's a different kind of diversity you might not know about, neurodiversity. Neurodiversity is the concept that neurological differences among people should be recognized and respected. I believe it's time for this new social movement, the neurodiversity movement, to take off. Neurodiversity is a part of our genetics and of our evolution as a species. The genes for autism and ADHD are not errors but rather are the result of variations in the human genome that have and will continue to have advantages for society. One of the genes associated with ADHD, the DRD4 gene, is known as the novelty-seeking gene. It arrived on the human evolutionary scene over 10,000 years ago. Genes associated with autism also go back more than 10,000 years. Research suggests that genetic variants linked to autism might have been positively selected during human evolution because they contributed to exceptional memory skills heightened perception in vision, taste, and smell, a precise eye for detail, and an enhanced understanding of systems such as animal behavior. These characteristics likely remain in the gene pool today because they are still advantageous. As a psychologist advising the parents of differently wired kids, I tell parents they have a choice between trying to change the child to fit the environment and changing the environment to fit the child. There are many different microhabitats and subcultures in our world. For an individual with autism or ADHD, finding success on their own terms may come from discovering the particular niche that fits best, the niche that allows their strengths to shine and their challenges to be minimized. Individuals with ADHD tend to thrive in situations of rapid change, variety, and that reward creativity and out-of-the-box thinking. Career as a comedian, detective, entrepreneur, journalist, actor, EMT technician, or photographer could be. I'm not saying that having autism or ADHD is easy. And I don't mean to downplay the real suffering that can be caused by having a neurodevelopmental condition, disability, or difference. But it's also time the world sees the beauty and value in brain differences. Neurodiversity might be every bit as crucial for the human race as biodiversity is for life in general. My vision is for a neurodiversity tolerant and accepting society where differences are celebrated for the depth and dimension they bring to the human condition. I want children whose brains are wired differently to be encouraged to find their niche instead of changing to fit other people's ideas of normal. Diversity in every sense makes our world a better place and people who think differently are a huge part of that. So as you can see, um, people with autism or who are neurodiverse are very unique thinkers. Um, 
it's they're going to solve problems differently. They're going to find new ways or um, ideas that maybe no one else has thought of. They're very unique in the way that they think because they are so visual and so specific um, and tuned in to details. Um, they tend to learn the job and they do it the same way every time. Um, they're not going to look to cut corners or miss things because they're distracted. They're very focused. Um, they have great attention to detail. And these, as I said, are, are rule followers. Um, it is important to individuals on the spectrum to know what the rules are and to follow them. So they tend to adhere strictly to those rules. They're, they're rarely absent. They're on time. Um, they're going to be honest, sometimes brutally honest. Um, but these also are folks who are uniquely wired to find um, small inconsistencies or errors or um, just very, very good at picking up on things that require attention to detail. Again, they're um, going to reduce your turnover. Um, sorry, this is the same. They, they tend to stay in the jobs more often uh, and have they're dedicated to their employers. Um, for many individuals with autism, it's very difficult to get in the door. So when they finally get a job, um, they're very dedicated to that employer. Um, and they're not looking for other opportunities um, out there. So they're not job hopping. Um, and that's going to reduce your um, need to retrain staff over and over. How many of us have staff that we train and then they leave? Um, and so with being that will allow you the more time um, to focus on what your business needs are. The other things that we know are that this is very untapped talent pool. Um, they have the skills that a lot of companies need, but in reality, um, this says 25% of um, are employed at their potential. Basically, what I'm going to say is that 80% of folks on the autism spectrum who have any type of college degree or training, two year, four year, six year, eight year, 80% um, of those individuals are unemployed. And that's ridiculous um, because they have excellent skills and abilities that need to be um, utilized. The accommodations that folks need are pretty minimal. As I said, um, giving someone a visual of how to de-stress, um, who to go to when something's not working. Um, the other things that they need are, we need to start back at training the managers and HR on the benefits of hiring folks on the spectrum and how to understand that culture of autism. Why are 80% of these folks unemployed? Well, if you think about your own interview process, it's a social contest. We know that when you go into an interview, the people who are interviewing make judgments on your communication style, what they consider your personability, are you going to fit in with the team, all of those things. And so our folks are destined to fail. Um, a social contest is not one that an individual on the spectrum is likely to win. What we do know is um, if you allow that applicant to show you their skills, so do what we call a skills interview, they might blow it out of the water. <laughs> um, I had a young, uh, a young girl I was working with who had a bachelor's in computer science and she went in for an interview and they were talking verbally to her about a computer problem. How would you solve this? Describe to me how you would do this. And she was quiet. She couldn't think. And so then they gave her a piece of paper and a pencil and said, well, write it down. You know, show me the process. And she tried to do it and she got really frustrated. And I spoke up and said, you know what? Can you just give her a computer? 
and let her work out this problem for you. And she lit up and she was so excited and she said, what language, what computer language do you want me to use to solve this? And they said, you can choose, it, it's okay. About five minutes she was done, she said, I, I went ahead and did it in both languages. Um, so they were stunned. Um, and she is now employed with an international company doing artificial intelligence. She would never have been given the opportunity to have that if it weren't for a different style of interviewing. She needed to be able to show um, because her computer programming and networking is something that's done visually. It's not a verbal explanation of how that works. So we need to think about how are we interviewing people um, for the jobs that we need to fill. We ask you to look at your job description. Um, is it five pages long? Is it incorporate everything that might possibly ever come across? We want you to look at it and say, what are the top five to ten skills that I must have? Wh what do I have to have with this person um, to be successful? And then let's look at those things. So we want to train the employers in HR on a better way of reaching that talent that's untapped um, that can really enhance the company. What we look at as strategies for success is that we do that employer training. Um, so that's HR, staff, coworkers, hiring managers. We employ, um, we're gonna train them on understanding this culture of autism. We're gonna work with the individual um, who's on the spectrum to really understand those soft skills. We're gonna work on that employment readiness, things like that. And then we're gonna provide that long-term support so um, if a new manager comes in and the individual, your coworker is having some struggles, we can come in and, and work on that, on how do we, how do we adjust um, and how do we understand the new requirements from the new supervisor um, and that sort of thing. Um, and all of that is gonna work on providing success for both the employer, the coworker, um, and the individual on the spectrum because we want it to be successful for everybody involved, not just the person with autism. There is a statewide initiative here in North Carolina um, called Link It, which is linking, innovative linking North Carolina to innovative talent. And what we do is we help really look at that um, hiring policies and procedures for companies, um, and then we look at where, is your, where are you having a deficit? Where, where do you need employees? Where's your hardest place? Um, or the, what is the, the job that you're really having a hard time filling? And then we can do some of that recruitment, look at the, the individuals that we're working with, who's a good fit, um, and this is just how we do that. What you can expect from the Autism Society, um, and there are other companies out there, especially in the far west. You know, how do we understand and apply those principles? We're gonna help you identify that talent pool. And then, like I said, we provide support from hiring the person, getting them in the door, um, doing the onboarding, because onboarding and usually doesn't have as much to do with a specific job as it does company policies and things like that. We provide training. Now, training is on the autism. Um, I know nothing about cybersecurity or data analytics or artificial intelligence, so I can't help them learn that job. The individuals that we work with already have those skills. When we talk about training, we're talking about those soft skills, the autism-specific skills, um, and then we provide that ongoing support. We use that I do, we do, you do kind of process where I'll do it, I can show you how to do it. So I can work with an individual or I can look at your interview questions and figure out, um, do you, are you asking what you really mean to ask? Um, and then we can work on doing that together and then you can do the interview. Um, but this is a, a process we use because it helps support those employers 
we work with them together and then we slowly start pulling ourselves out so that you're doing it and you're providing the support that's going to help you feel more confident and feel like you have the tools you need um, and it's going to overall increase the culture of autism um, and the awareness of that culture within your company. What we're seeing is that <clears throat> when we help place an individual on the spectrum within a company, um, the managers have reported that they are overall better managers because when you modify your language and become direct and concrete, you are going to um, be more effective with all of your um, employees. And you know, the supports that we use for individuals with autism have proven to be effective with people with other types of neurodiversity. So we want to think about some of those things. Um, and when it gets complicated, you know, sometimes we have difficulty. Um, we can support you through some of those difficulties. And if it comes to a termination where the person is just not meeting the needs, we can help support you with how's the best way to, to handle that and do that. Um, it does happen, and we can support you. So um, I hope I've given you a really good understanding, and now I want to open it to take questions. And David, do you want to help tell me what the questions are, if there are any? And um, Yeah, so far there are not. Um, there was a comment about... Um um, a little bit of feedback, uh, talking about all adults on the spectrum, not just the younger adults. There might be some older adults trying yes. that are having struggles getting into the job market or, mm -hmm. or finding that good match. Um, and it, again, it was feedback, not so much a question, but maybe um, you have thoughts on you know the differences between um, how an older adult uh, who might have been out there trying to to, to find a match. What, what should what should they do at this point in time? Is that something that we can help them with? Or, or what would be the, I guess, the starting points for them to have an additional conversation about um, finding some assistance? Um, okay, that, there's a lot of things in there. Um, I would say some of the strategies that we find for some of our older folks who, um, and even the younger folks, but people who have an education and have a skill but haven't had the opportunity to get in there um, and show a company, we will approach companies and ask for maybe a 12-week internship. So it's kind of a job trial where the employee um, gets an opportunity to show the skills they have and to adjust to the working environment. But it also gives the employer um, a little reassurance that um, to take the risk to bring somebody in. Um, because sometimes employers are just hesitant because they don't know what they're getting into. Um, but more often than not, it turns into a very successful placement. So it's giving those little small, what we call internships of about 12 weeks, gives enough time for everyone to see is this, is this something we can do. And then, you know, it can end because the employer doesn't feel it's a good fit or the employee doesn't feel it's a good fit. And that way there's no long-term commitment and people are more willing to take a risk. On the other hand, um, we look at the individual um, on the spectrum and see what skills they have. We look at where the gaps are. Is there anything that we need to do to update their skills? Things like that. Um, and so we do help more direct placement um, and there are, again, depending on which counties you all are in, there are companies within your counties that can do more direct um, in-person supports um, and those types of things. Does that answer it, David? <clears throat> yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, and again, um, as I put into the chat, if anybody else has any questions, please go ahead and drop those in. We've got just a couple of minutes uh, in the allotted time for this webinar. And again, as I mentioned before, we do appreciate you attending today's uh, session. This is an important topic. We are recording it. We will have it added to our website under the webinar section uh, next month. And um, what we'll do is we'll make sure that everybody gets uh, a heads up email when that recording is available. And we welcome you sharing it with members of your community. 
to help us raise awareness of the benefits of hiring workers with autism uh, throughout our state. And then there is um, a, an open-ended question where if you want a follow-up conversation uh, with Mindy, you can request that, or if you have um, additional topics that you would like for us to discuss or drill down on, we'd be happy to take that into consideration as we plan out our webinars for the rest of the year. Well, thank you, I am, everyone. I dots. Yeah, so. Um, I covered Mindy, a lot of information. <laughs> I covered a lot of information in this period, and so please feel free to reach out if you need clarity on anything, but I appreciate you taking the time to come join us. Well, and thank you, Mindy, for the excellent information. Know that um, this is something there's a lot of interest in. Every time we do a workshop on employment, we get a lot of people that sign up and want to learn more about how they can um, have help uh, in their job search or how to uh, think about that for their loved ones. So uh, this is not the last time you'll see a workshop listed for employment um, or employment supports through the Autism Society of North Carolina. Uh, we are at the end of our time. So again, I'm going to end the webinar for everybody. Take a couple minutes to fill out that survey. And as I mentioned in the chat, I will send uh, a copy of the deck in a PDF format via email. Uh, either later today or tomorrow to the attendees. Thanks again for being with us. Uh, if you have other questions or have other support needs from the Autism Society of North Carolina, we are here to help, so don't hesitate to reach out to us. Have Thank a wonderful you. rest of your day.